Good morning, everyone. In this presentation, I will present some of our recent successes with the single grain luminescence dating methods in dating paleo seismic events and how we extract your additional information from the same data set. But first, I would like to thank my collaborators and the funding agencies for supporting our work. Luminescence dating is a burial dating technique. Quartz and feldspar, when exhumed to the surface as part of the bedrock, they start accumulating trapped charges in their finite crystal defects. This happens due to the presence of naturally occurring ionizing radioactive elements such as uranium, thorium, and potassium. And we can explain this process through this simple battery diagram. The trapped charges, such as electrons and holes, when they are exposed to the sunlight, they get excited, they recombine and emit photon or light. And all the luminescent signals that pre was previously stored are now gone. And we call this process bleaching or signal resetting. Bleaching may happen as part of the bedrock when they're exposed to the surface and exposed to sun, or during the transport of the sediments, the sed sediments that's coming from the erosion of this bedrock. When these sediments are redeposited, they again start accumulating the trapped charges. We then bring those sediments back to our lab without exposing them to the sun and artificially stimulate them. We record the amount of light emitted, which we call the equivalent dose. Based on the concentration of the radioactive elements in the sample and the site, we also determine the rate at which the trapped charges have been accumulated. And we call that dose rates. Once we have both of these variables, we can then determine how long the sediment has been buried. Post-depositional sediment mixing is one of the major challenges in luminescence dating. And statistical techniques are often insufficient to distinguish mixed populations in multigrain method. Here in this figure, we show two of these methods. Plot A showing the two distinct subpopulations of equivalent doses, which was determined using the single grain technique where each individual grain is targeted. And plot B shows a broad scatter of equivalent doses, which is based on multi-grain single aliquot methods, which means that we combine multiple grains together to get one signal. If we measure equivalent doses from this multi-grain method, as you can expect, the phantom doses are inevitable consequences of this averaging effect. In other words, we might get a signal then that may be an average of both of these subpopulations. Clearly then, single grain method offer much higher resolution over the multi-grain method and can help resolve the existence of two or more subpopulations. Now, quartz, although considered the best candidate for luminescence dating, are much dimmer in Southern California and therefore are not suitable for single grain analysis with the current technology. Feldspar, primarily potassium feldspar, on the other hand, has more complicated system, but they are much brighter in this kind of environment. Another major limitation with potassium feldspar is that it takes several minutes to several hours to completely bleach, unlike quartz, which bleach in few seconds when they're exposed to the sun. The bleaching potentiality of potassium feldspar also depends on the duration and the medium of the transport, as is shown in this diagram. For example, windblown sediments bleach well. Sediments in concentrated flows, not so much. For example, since concentrated flows, such as flash floods, dominate in the semi-arid Southern California, often complete bleaching is not guaranteed. And we often see samples with multiple single grain subpopulations, as is shown over here by this kernel density plot, especially at higher temperature. This is a dose response curve from Vassalini et al, where normalized luminescent signals are plotted for 50 degrees centigrade in black and two to five degrees centigrade in red. Note that since we are mostly interested in potassium feldspar, we stimulate the samples using infrared and the method is called post-infrared, infrared stimulated luminescence dating. Usually the low temperature IR50 signals are relatively brighter, but they are mostly coming from shallower unstable traps. They are easy to bleach, but they fade over time, which is basically loss of signals over time from these finite traps of these grains. Hence, they are less reliable. In contrast, high to higher temperature IR2 to 5 signals are in most cases opposite to IR50 and are more reliable. 
but they are often hard to bleach. In this study, I'll show you how we exploited these unique characteristics of potassium feldspar to date not only the most recent depositional events, but also the older depositional events. First, I'll present the effectiveness of single grain luminescence dating in the lower mission peak catchment, where we dated the paleoseismic event horizon on the banning strand of the San Andreas Fault. Second, we'll show you how we extracted additional information from the same samples, including some of the preliminary data from the upper mission peak catchment. Both of these works are now published. Here, the quaternary fault map showing the lower mission peak floodplain deposits and the upper mission peak alluvial fan deposits, two of our main study sites for this presentation. We took advantage of a 250 meter long and eight meter deep trench near 18th Avenue at the North Palm Spring on the banning strand of the Southern San Andreas Fault. The trench exposed a 40 meter wide fault zone for us to do most of our work. In these photos, Sally is recording the paleoseismic information from the trench and Sulgi is collecting luminescent samples, mostly from homogeneous sandy units. This is a simplified trench log showing the eight event horizons in both the trench walls. We collected a total of 17 luminescent samples from distinct marker horizons. The sample locations are shown by these black circles. We processed and measured these samples at the UCLA's luminescence laboratory. This includes age analysis of 754 single grains. We also dated around 33 radiocarbon charcoal samples from this trench. This figure shows the two representative samples from the trench. On the left, we have radial plot showing the equivalent doses along the arc. And on the right, we have the probability density plot. We use over dispersion or OD to estimate the scatter in single grain equivalent doses. Usually when the OD is less than 15%, and single grain doses are well clustered within two sigma, as is shown for the sample 1286, we use the central age model. Our assumption for the central age model is that all the grains are likely completely bleached during their last exposure. However, if the OD is more than 15% and multiple subpopulations are suspected, as shown here on this radial plot and also in the PDF for the sample 1287, we apply either the minimum age model or the finite mixture model if we wanted to know how many subpopulations are present. Minimum age model explicitly assumes that the youngest subpopulation represent the most recent depositional history. That's good for dating paleoseismic events. However, in this case, we also assume that the older subpopulation likely did not see sunlight and hence retained their past depositional history. And if our assumption is true, we can utilize the youngest subpopulations to get the most recent history, plus the older finite mixture model subpopulations to extract additional depositional history. This slide summarizes our dating results from the banning paleoseismic site. We mostly use minimum age model in our samples to estimate the most recent depositional history for those sedimentary packages with the idea to constrain the groundbreaking earthquake events. Only one sample appears completely bleached, as I showed in the last slide, and we use the central age model on that. The left plot shows all those luminescence ages in circles plotted against the stratigraphic depth. We not only found good correspondence between the single grain luminescence ages and the stratigraphic order, but also with the youngest charcoal ages in the upper section shown by these rectangles. Charcoals in the older sections appear much older than the corresponding luminescence ages, and in some cases with the youngest charcoal ages, hence they are removed. There also shows much higher uncertainty for the older samples. These high resolution preferred age data when plotted in Oxcal gives an average recurrence interval of 380 to 640 years for the banning strand, which is intermediate between the longer interval published for the San Gorgonio Pass fault zone and the shorter intervals on both the Mission Creek and the Coachella sections of the Southern San Andreas Fault. We further analyze the single grain ages. Note here that all the ages and the relative probabilities are in the log scale. All the rate PDFs are the probability distribution of individual 
finite mixture models of populations. And the black PDF is the composite of these individual subpopulations. Using 51 single grain subpopulation uh, ages identified by the finite mixture model from all 17 samples collected from distinct stratigraphic units, we identified at least eight significant age clusters during the Holocene. Note that each prominent age cluster consists of three or more subpopulations. We interpret those age clusters as significant depositional events, and they show good correspondence with the weighter than average Holocene climate events as shown by this proxy graph from the Lower Bear Lake. We recently also tested our hypothesis by collecting sediment samples from seven one meter deep pits in the upper Mission Creek nested alluvial fan surfaces. And we compared those results with our lower Mission Creek floodplain results, which is shown over here. Broadly, the preliminary data shows remarkable similarities in the composite PDF peaks between the upper Mission Creek fans and the lower Mission Creek floodplain deposit, which is very exciting. So the take home message that I want to convey here is that K feldspar single grain luminescence complements C14 dating, where reworking of charcoals are problematic or suitable organic matters are absent. It has the potentiality to date both the most recent, which most of the time paleoseismologists are interested, at the same time, also the older depositional history, which where the paleoclimatologists are mostly interested. That means that we can extract additional details about the climate control sediment flux and depositional history from the same site using the same samples. That is the information in between earthquake events. Weighter than average Holocene climate plays the first order control on the sediment deposition in Southern California. And it has important implications for tectonic and paleoclimate studies that rely on stratigraphic completeness, especially in terrestrial setting. Our future work is focused on finding better ways to develop more collaborations within paleoseismologists, paleoclimatologists, and other geochronologists to extract more information between earthquake events utilizing the single grain technique. Please come to Marina's poster, number 88, to know more about our such collaborative efforts that are currently underway. Thank you.